All right, everyone. Welcome back to the last day of the Midwest Mountaineering Outdoor Adventure Expo. Uh, kicking off the presentations today, I have Bob O'Hara. Uh, yeah, he's a member of the Explorers Club of New York and, of course, the Midwest Mountaineering Minnesota Explorers Hall of Fame. Um, we got <clears throat> over 50 years of canoe expeditions uh, all over the far north, rivers in Alaska, the, the territories, Nunavut, etc. Uh, this presentation is called Expedition Planning with an Emphasis on Canoeing. So without further ado, here's Bob O'Hara. Hey, thanks, Aiden, and thank you for inviting me. This is my third and last Zoom show, and it's been lots of fun. And let's hop right into it. So <clears throat> Expedition Bound, today's program is says planning, and planning um, means getting organized, obviously. And these are lessons I learned either from reading, talking to people, or uh, going to symposiums, seminars, or my actual physical experience of being in the North. So every trip has to have a beginning and to do that, you need to select a river or a given area. And sometimes I select a half a dozen rivers until we get them narrowed down. You need to do some research and today that's easy to do on the internet. And in my trips, that, that took a long time. Sometimes it took you two years to put a trip together doing research. And then you make a lot of plans and no matter how many plans you make, you never make enough. But the most important thing is you have to follow your plan. And that's where people get in trouble if they don't. And then very important for you and for future travelers is record your experiences so you can share them. So expeditions have been going to the north forever. The Greeks we know were there in 500 AD. We know that the Vikings came through. We know that there've been all kinds of uh, people looking for the Northwest Passage, and there were some really interesting uh, stories and trials, and people died, and they eventually found their way. They didn't have a satellite to tell them where to go, so it took almost 100 years to get that done. Samuel Hearn showed up to Churchill, and in 1767, he walked from Churchill, and he went all the way across with, with I think, probably some canoes also, but the Native people led him from Churchill all the way to Copper Mine on the Arctic Ocean. Pretty amazing. Great book. So here's my, my kind of playground. So all the white is Canada. And um, the, the big piece of Canada is, of course, Hudson Bay. And then the black on the far left next to Yukon would be the uh, Alaska. And the big island off to the upper right is Greenland. <clears throat> and Northwest Territories um, is a is a territory with the Yukon Territory and Northwest Territories in 1999 got split. The East half and all the Arctic Archipelago Islands pretty much became the Inuit country and the McKenzie River, you can see from Great Slave Lake all the way going to the Arctic Ocean was mostly the native people. Here's another picture showing the uh, same areas, but a little different color here. And you can see Minneapolis down on the bottom with the red arrow. That's where I live. And roads lead all the way north, but not to Churchill. You have to take a train to get to Churchill. You can drive all the way out to Great Slave Lake. And now it's paved. Uh, when I first started going to Great Slave in 1970, we had 1,200 miles of gravel, which was not the best to drive. There's a large white line going from Churchill up to Nuvik. Pretty much everything to the right side is tundra and pretty much everything to the left side is trees. So you can go way up to Great Slave Lake or Great Bear and still be in a tree line. And if you just went east, you'd be in the tundra. So here's that flag of Nunavut. It's got a nookshuk, which means something like a man. It's, it's what the Inuit built on the land to travel to mark their way. It's got the white, which I think probably symbolizes winter and snow in the North Star. And it's got the left side is uh, yellow, which is probably all the bright sun that you get in the summer. So how do you put a trip together? Well, for one thing, you got to have some money. Got to have money for everything. And, and the trip you take will depend upon how your finances dictate. And I've run a lot of trips with a very limited budget. And it's amazing how far you can go if you plan carefully. Then you need to have a crew. And if you don't want to have a crew, that means you're going solo. There's nothing wrong with that, except you have to learn to love yourself, obviously. And then you need equipment. And then you have to have enough time. And time today is a simple, 
single most precious commodity. It's amazing to people who have money and have no time, okay? And then the last thing you have to be concerned about are emergencies. And today that's easier to take care of. Back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we were on our own. And if something happened, we were out of luck. We'd have to take care of ourselves. <clears throat> so here's the first descent, 2005. We went north to Baker Lake, went down the Earl Smith River to the town of Cougarook. That's what the current name is. It was called Pelly Bay. And it took 10 years to put that together because we could never get the planes and the crew and things to match up. And we finally did. Here's a crew on the Bailey River. We like a lot of flags. This is not a government flag. This is simply a tourism flag of coming to the far north. The Northwest Territories use as symbol for everything. Here's a crew on the, on the uh, Dubont River. We're at, uh, I think, Dubont Lake. And this is a, um, a big glacial erratic. This fell out of the glacier and it didn't disappear in water. Luckily, it landed on land. And it was first discovered by Terrell, who was a government geologist, who was the first white person to come through this area in the 1850s. And his journals are fun to read. So hazards and hardships. Well, weather is always both a hazard and a hardship. And weather changes all the time. And weather changes all over the world. And the weather in the north tends to be more on the cold side, but it can be hot sometimes. But Weather is weather. The biggest problem we have with weather is wind. Bugs are part of the ecosystem and you simply live with them and they like to live with you sometimes, but you plan for it. Some rivers have rapids, some don't. And if you have a crew that's not rapids trained or you don't take courses to get trained, then that would be a, a river that you would avoid at that time. Time away from home, surprisingly, there are a lot of people who have not been away from home for very long. And there can be a withdrawal issue with those people. So you have to prepare for that a little bit. There are some physical demands, but depending on what you do normally, they're probably not any more than you already do. If you bike or hike or exercise and you're in good shape, you're no problem. Navigation is easy on rivers, you're simply going downstream. Um, pretty hard to get lost. Uh, if you're going across big lakes, you could get twisted around, but you probably won't disappear off the lake. You just have to paddle an extra bay or two. You will have long daylight up to 24 hours. And um, some people are not used to that. If you can't sleep in daylight, you have to bring something to darken your eyes. There will be lots of sun, which means you have to worry about sunburn and it's cool enough that you can wear clothing to protect you. And a lot of the clothing today comes with a uh, sun protection built into it. Water temperatures are on the cool to cold side. It's not swimming water. So you have to be prepared for that. Water levels you can't control, but I've been there when we were in flood stage, that's a hazard. And I've also been there when we were in low water and that's a real hardship sometimes. And the other things you need to stay on course and we always, if possible, plan for an alternate exit. If we're way behind schedule or we, we get stuck in the ice, is there another way we can go? And that's something to investigate when you do that. So here's the $64,000 question. When is the ice gonna go out? Now with global warming is changing a little bit, but I've seen ice as late as August 12th. Okay, we came down the Kazan River and got there and Baker Lake was frozen solid. That was, took us four days to get around to get to Baker Lake, which is roughly a day or day and a half paddle. Here's the Hood River. We showed up in middle to late July and the plane couldn't land at the lake. And they went downstream and found a little backwater and put us in there. And then we beat through this candle ice. And here's the last of the ice. You can see we got a little opening and the way we went. Notice how clean and clear the water is in the far north. <clears throat> Here's the Deer River. We came off the train and we're gonna paddle to Churchill and there was no ice, but we had a ton of snow, which limited where we could camp. And we didn't have any leaves on the trees yet. So that's the Kazan River just before Kazan Falls and that was really high. 
and you had to be careful as you approach so you didn't go over. Here's the Bailey. Uh, these are simple rapids, one in class two, no rocks here. It's pretty much high water and we're just bouncing through it. And, and here we've got covers and those covers are for help you keep you dry, keep your gear dry, keep the water of the boat, never capsize the boat. That's kind of important to have. And if we're gonna do some white water, then the people need to know some white water strokes. And these two guys do a lot of paddling together and there are only a few basic strokes, but if you don't know them, you could be in trouble. And so here they're doing a draw to pull away from a rock. The other thing I've done on a lot of trips is I'll stick up one of the poles we use for a tarp. I'll stick it up in the canoe, put a little pennant on it and in running white water, you don't wanna be one right exactly behind the other. And some people, if they're going a little faster, might get a little bit ahead. But the nice thing is, if I can see those or they can see mine, we know everything is okay. And if we can't see them, then it means they're not upright. And that means you're looking for people someplace. We've never had that problem, but it's just planning ahead. Kujua River, another example of why covers are cool. Notice that that whole bow is buried as, it, as it's gonna be lifted up now. And that guy in the, in the bow is totally dry. There's a lot of times the river is rocky enough or you're not sure, or it's a cold, nasty day and you don't want to risk anything. And so we line the boats. That means walking the boats down the rapids. And if you notice in that front of that canoe, in the bow, you notice that it's not tied at the top. A hole has been drilled into the canoe a tube has been inserted and then you can run your ropes from there. And that makes the canoe safer. And the guy from the back can easily pull the canoe and hold it. And if it was up too high, the canoe would have, have a tendency to maybe flip over. It may, as crazy as it looks, lining isn't that hard. Sometimes you got a problem solve, which set of rocks do you want to go banging into, but it works. And it's a lot easier than taking three trips for a half a mile or a mile on a portage. And there's times you get to the bottom and you simply have to push or lift over the last set of rocks. So here's one of these nasty ledges. So we're using here hard shell boats. These are not Kevlar boats. And um, they're either ABS boats or they're uh, disco boats that are a polypropylene boat and they slide on the rocks really well. A short portage. This is over around a ledge and we just picked it up. Didn't, don't have the packs in it, but uh, pick it up and walk, it saves a lot of time. Notice the footwear, we're all wearing some kind of a rubber boot. If you go over the boot, you're gonna have wet feet and you just dump the water out. So this is my second time on the Kujua and, and notice the snow in the background, that's there all summer. That's something you have to be uh, prepared for in terms of clothing. You can have some cold days up there, maybe not. And in lower water, people have run this, but our crew wasn't extremely experienced. This was one of the only few rapids that we had to worry about on the whole trip. And so we did a lift over. We're just lifting over the rock. We're gonna just dump in and then throw the packs in. And there's times you have to walk. There's times it gets really shallow. There's times on a rapids, that you can get in and start walking, but it's still not deep enough to paddle. These are brand, brand new pack boats. And no, we are being very cautious. I think today I might try and run this, but we're being very cautious. And notice the name <coughs> Tuktu. And Tuktu means caribou. And all of my boats have a uh, Inuit animal name. And notice the pack boat was very smart. And the ring, to attach ropes to is in the proper place. It's down where it belongs. It's not up on top like the Grumman's have. Portaging is part of traveling. Not all trips have portages, but here we're jumping a watershed. We went up one watershed and we're portaging two miles over to another watershed to go downstream to get to Baker Lake. I like red. I also can be found in red. My pack since 88 have all been red. And it's a very buggy day, so we have a bug net on, and I've got something on my, my, uh, my wrist to protect me from getting bitten. When we make portages, if they're long ones, rather than kill yourself on too long a walk, we walk partway down, 
dropper packs or red ones are easy to find. Stick the paddles up for two reasons. One, they can't get stepped on and broken accidentally. And the other is they serve as a beacon. Sometimes you can see the paddle blade before you can see the pack. Here's a very, very long portage. It's a good three plus miles. You can see the river way down. It's full of vegetation. There's no rocks. And so we walk the canoes. It's safer. Can't get a twisted ankle. Can't get a twisted neck. Can't hurt your back. And we just hook up to some deer drags that are harnesses you throw around your shoulder. And we hook our ropes up and away we go. That canyon, by the way, is 180 feet deep. Here's a Cook Custom tarp. And it's a big tarp, and it will go up to like seven feet tall or eight feet tall. And what these young folks from St. Cloud have done is they're only using half the tarp, and they pull the other half down to make a very nice windbreak. And that's called adaptation. And that's one thing you can do with your equipment all the time. But notice there are canoes behind this tarp. All the packs, or most of the packs, are in the canoes. Because when a wind comes up, those canoes will blow away. That won't happen in the boundary waters normally, or they would be pushed into the forest. But here, and my friend had a chase this for over a mile, and what saved him is he got stuck in a little pond. Otherwise, he would have lost his canoe. So we've all carried some kind of instrumentation. I used to carry a lot of cameras. Now I carry smaller cameras. And other things that you want to keep totally waterproof and that might include your satellite phone, for example. <clears throat> but the thing that'll kill people is the seals need to be lubricated. And I'm telling you this from experience, not from a lesson I read, even though I read the lesson, I didn't do it. And um, you can get some wet cameras if you don't have those seals uh, checked every year. With the new waterproof cameras, point and shoot, you can keep them around your neck and you can shoot stuff as you go. And, a lot of these can do videos. This is a number of years old, but it's amazing what's out there electronically. A lot of people are carrying GoPro cameras. They can strap them on their head. They can strap them on their boat, whatever they want to do. It's amazing what you can do with today's technology. So you need a route and you need one that is practical for your time and practical for your experience and something that you can afford. Then you're going to need maps. And today you can get maps off the internet. You can go to Kinko's and you can print them on a plastic like paper. You can print them on both sides and they're really cool. And then I take my maps and I mark every contour line where it crosses. I measure the distance in between and I can calculate my drop per mile. And for example, the Mississippi River in most places is dropping two or three feet a mile. It's a pretty gentle drop. If you get up around 10, 12 feet a mile, that's a pretty fast running river. And if you get much above 14 or 15, it may not even be safe to run a canoe on it because you're going too fast and if there's rapids, big rapids, you're gonna be in trouble. On the other hand, if you get a big drop, 20, 30 feet, and it's very possible that as you start going, it's not dropping, that means you got waterfalls coming and you have to look out for them. Another thing to know when you travel is, do you have a prevailing wind? And you can get that by looking at weather data. So a lot of the winds in the Northwest Territories are north and west. And when you get an east wind, you're windbound. You don't go anywhere. And sometimes they run for two or three days. Here are some routes. This is from a, a Canadian map. You know, the Kazan River, Dubois River, and the Thiel and Hanbury Rivers all drop into Baker Lake. And those are all common routes. They're easily accessible in the central part of the US. And there's lots of different ways to get in. The Back River is one of the best rivers in the Arctic. Um, it ends in nowhere and it's hard to get out of there sometimes. There are some options, but uh, some of them can be expensive. So the left is the Coppermine River. You can be accessed from Yellowknife by three different ways, by going on land and going upstreams and getting to the headwaters, or you can take a short bush plane and hop up, and then you can come back with a commercial flight from uh, the end of the river. And a lot of people are now using pack boats because they can bring them out with them. Before, uh, it would be difficult to get out or a barge would come. You could ship it on a barge. It comes, goes around to the McKinsey River, comes all the way back to Great Slave Lake. It takes a year. Uh, Great Slave Lake, you can see there, there's a number of rivers that run into it. 
There's also the McKenzie River, which is the Mississippi of the far north, and you could take that all the way to the Arctic Ocean and to Inuvik. Here's some of my rivers, and I've done a number of these uh, two times or five times. And uh, after I run out of some of those rivers, I've taken three trips now to Alaska, partially because it's easier, it's less hassle, and it fits our pack boats. So here's a, a one to 50,000 map, and the arrow is pointing to the 80, and the 80 means 80 miles to go. And rather than start at mile one and count up, I start at mile one and go backwards. And so on any given day, when I look at the map, I, I know how many miles I have to go. <clears throat> also the 250 is the contour line and the contours can be 50 meters apart or hundred meters apart, depending on the scale of the map. If you look at the word hood and look just beyond the D, you can see those contour lines that are all really stacked up together. And that means it is a, a big cliff or it means it's a really big hill. It'll be a challenge to walk up there. And then you can't see it very well, but where the 250 is just to the left, there's a little bit of funny marks on there. And that means uh, it's fast water uh, and it could be rapids. And unfortunately, not all the waterfalls are marked on some of the maps. Some people carry a, a GPS and that verifies where they are, if you can verify that with your map. But I find the map is all I need and I don't need the GPS. GPS people are mostly backpackers and hikers who need to make sure they know where they're going. Okay, crew selection. <clears throat> so you need different skills. And um, if you got four cooks and no navigator, you're gonna get lost. And if you got four navigators and no cook, you're gonna be hungry. So you gotta have a little bit of everything, okay? And the more skills, the better. One of the important things is you have to maintain your compatibility and there are some ways to do that. And one way we did one year is I paddled with one guy and I slept with the other guy. And that was a nice way of getting communication and having somebody new to talk to, okay? It's very important in doing crew selection that people have input. So one year, I picked guy number two and the two of us picked guy number three and the three of us picked guy number four. And so to get on that trip, you had to satisfy a lot of people if you were number four, but you only had to satisfy me if you were number two, okay? <clears throat> commitments, always a challenge. And I've had people who made commitments and had to break them for various reasons. And I had one group, we had a group of six and a month before the trip, four guys had to drop out for various reasons. So that just left two of us. And we still went, we still did the trip. Just didn't take all the food, obviously. Generation gaps, I've never had an issue with that because I was a school teacher. And so I was working with generation gaps my whole life. And I know people who won't go outside of the generation gap. I know some groups that travel every five to seven years, it's the same bunch of people. They don't wanna go with new people. They don't wanna take a chance that someone's not gonna fit in. Have I been burned on, on working with so many people? Maybe, but not really, I've been very fortunate. <clears throat> Gender differences, uh, most women are physically not as strong as men, but they have good stamina. And there's a lot of women today who do great outdoor skills. When I started out, we didn't have many, but in our last 20 some years, we've had a number of women on our trips, some married, some not. <clears throat> Decision-making is a way you have to figure out your crew in rock, paper, scissors is a poor way to make decisions and flipping a coin is a worse way to make decisions. Remember money always makes the difference if people are coming or not. And, and different crews have different ways of doing that. Some people put all the money in the pot at one time. Some people put a deposit in, depending on how much money you have to put forward with a bush pilot or whatever. And you need to be on a similar terminology. And that's just a way of explaining things on the person you're paddling with better understand when you want to go left, what you're saying and what that means left. And then I had one guy who couldn't figure out left from right. So every time I want to go left, I say paddle right and he go left. So that was perfect. And then everybody wants to have a positive attitude for the whole trip. And that's, that's not too hard to maintain, but there are some stressors that you're going to have to deal with. So here's the Churchill finish the Deer River. We're flying the flag of Manitoba. 
And this is Dorothy Dick Peterson, a, a woman I taught with. And we've been in the Boundary Waters a lot. And this was a trip that fit her skill level. And she's a wonderful lady. And uh, we've had some great trips together. <clears throat> These are some young guys. They're from St. Cloud, Minnesota. They belong to the Les Voyagers uh, crew. It's a, a program started by a, a high school teacher who's now retired, initially for his high school only. And now they uh, have expanded to everybody in the city. And this was, and the Y camps do the same thing from Minnesota, Wisconsin. And I ran into them at Kazan Falls. They're great kids. And they, of course, they're, they're, their finances are tighter than most people. And when we got to Baker Lake, I took them out for a pizza place. There was a place that, that did food for uh, mining crews. And 100 bucks got me three pizzas, and we all had a good time. Here's Lee Sessions. We've been on 10 trips together, and we're dressing for the weather. So there's his anorak, and that's basically his wind gear for paddling. It's going to start to drizzle. He's putting on his rain suit. This is Lee and I in the Soros River starting out. We just came out of the ice. And here's my Skeena, which is a $3,000 fiberglass canoe from Source River. Fantastic boat, so the best river boat I've ever had. It virtually steers itself down river. And the hardest thing to do is on that $3,000 boat is to take your drill and cut a hole through the hull so you can attach your lightning ropes, <clears throat> but it has to be done. Here's a good father-daughter team. They're great. These guys were from Rochester. They're now living back in Canada. Here's a husband wife team, good communication. The bow person will always see the rock before the stern person does. So you gotta be able to communicate really well. Sick sick is one of the two ways to spell ground squirrel. Here's another husband wife team in the canyons on the Horton River. Notice just to the left of them, there's a rock that's pretty well hidden. It's a big pillow. And here again, you have to have communication and, and the woman is pulling to the left to keep them away from going into the pillow. Here's some young guys from, from uh, uh, Yellowknife on Great Slave Lake. And they were professional guys, Lee had met them and they wanted to go on a trip. And so we all went up and did the uh, Hood River together. And we had a marvelous time. Here's portages and everybody has to kind of do their fair share and you divide up the labor and you let people take what they're able to carry and you just work around that. So playtime is important. And one way to play coming down the Hood River, these guys saw this big esker and they ran up and they slid down. There's a kid in everybody and don't suppress it. <clears throat> Here's the most awesome view you can ever have hanging on the top of Wilberforce Falls. It drops 180 feet. The first drop is 90 feet. And it's just mesmerizing. And we spent a whole day and a half there just to enjoy it. Far way down at the bottom of the falls, there was a place where there was some water coming down the canyon and, and this young guy could handle the, the temperature. So he went in and had a shower. Story time is good. Fellowship is good. So we're on the, on the tundra and um, we have a lean three from Dan Cook. It's our shelter tent that we do all our cooking in. Uh, bad weather, you can get in there. And uh, we're all sitting around and we're flying our Nunavut flag. And notice the tents not next to us. Tents are all scattered for various reasons. <clears throat> and if you want some privacy, <clears throat> you can go to your tent. <clears throat> this is coming down the no attack, a group that went from 25 years of age to 72. And I now take an iPad with me and I do my journal on it. And um, I can also use it a little bit for photography if I want, but I forgot that I had some trips that I had done for Midwest Mountaineering at the Expo and they were on my iPad. And so on a, on a day we had some time to spare, um, we did a slideshow for these guys. And you see that fence around us, that's a bear fence, this electric bear fence. The one guy in the black is from Vancouver, does a lot of hunting and he brought that along just in case. We used it a couple of times we use it mostly for our food packs. I was claustrophobic sleeping in that bear fence. We were all, it wasn't that big. The tents were too crowded together. So here's a generational gap from 25 to 72. I'm the 72 year old. That was eight years ago. And the guy in the far right is in that young group. 
and those two guys paddle together and then the two oldest guys paddle together and we often let them be the lead canoe because they might as well have the fun the experience of seeing things on the river first and occasionally they would go down a wrong channel and we wouldn't say much and then they hit a dead end and we'd wait for them to paddle back and join us. Stress is going to occur. You have stress in everyday life. You have stress in your family. You have stress at work. You have stress everywhere. Just driving on a road can be very stressful. So it's going to happen. And so you have to be prepared for it. You can prevent a lot of your stress based on what's happening. So if people are cold and wet and hungry, you stop and you get dry and you get fed. Simple as that. You have to have some coping techniques for some kinds of stress. Um, we had a couple with us one year and it was windy and the lady was afraid to paddle. And uh, we took about an hour and talked about techniques and talked about how safe it could be and that we would start out. And she finally said, fine. And she and her husband then joined us and away we went. Staying dry, staying warm and staying well nourished prevents a lot of stressful situations. And most important on any big trip, you need some private time and you need to take out some time. You need to, so some of the guys will hike, some of the guys will go fish, some of the guys will read, some of the people will just take a nap, okay? This was very stressful. My first time in the Arctic, 1969, hit Aberdeen Lake. We had all the wrong clothing, didn't have any lining ropes, got aluminum canoes, didn't know there could be ice that late in the summer. And we got stuck there for 10 days. <clears throat> We're running very short of food. Until the ice broke up, we couldn't catch any fish ran into some biologists who had an Inuit guide with them and they were also stuck and some caribou came by and the Inuit guy took my gun and went and shot caribou. And so we had some fresh caribou steaks for a number of days. This is stressful, could be. <clears throat> this is on the Kunwak River. This ice field is always there. This is snow that's blowing in and then it condenses. This is how glaciers are built. So we paddle down it, but it, normally it's about um, maybe uh, up knee deep at the most. I came by one year and it was just a mess. And I didn't know if I could trust paddling down through there because if you hit a tunnel, do you dare go into it? And the other is if you kind of hit a, what looks like a dead end, how do you get up on top of that ice? So we had to get all the way around it. That was a real hassle. It was unexpected. <clears throat> Black flies don't come every day, but when they hatch out, they can be notorious. And if you're having lunch, you simply adapt for it. We often will start out with some fresh food. So here we got some peppers and mushrooms and lettuce and easy to carry for a day or two. And the temperatures usually are such that that stuff doesn't go bad right away. <clears throat> you can make bannocks. You can put anything you want in them. You can put raisins and nuts and everything else. You can put every kind of jam on them and they're really good. <clears throat> So here's some cakes, this, the, the Les Voyagers kids made them. This is their plate, I don't agree with it because I don't know how you keep your food warm, but um, that's, their, that's their trip, that's the way they do things. <clears throat> and there's nothing nicer than having dry feet. And then some days when you're in the water a lot, your feet just can't stay dry. And the water does come over the boots. So getting dry feet is a real treat. This is the closest I've come to dry feet. These are uh, Choda, I call them Huggies. And it's real light fabric and they're waterproof. This is what waders are made out of. And these will come up to your thigh. The, the, the Achilles heel is the neoprene bottoms. And if you walk anywhere, there's rough rocks and you get a puncture hole, then it's for not. And I did that on the third trip on my right foot. My right foot was wet the entire time. And we do journaling and that's important. And we look at the map on what we did that day and. We project what we want to do the next day. And we keep notes. I don't write the best notes in the world, um, but I have basic notes and that helps. And then time out. Well, time out sometimes is given to you when it's too windy to travel. Time out can happen when you're waiting for tide on the ocean. And time out often happens every day after lunch. It's just part of doing the trip. And it regenerates everybody. Here's time out. Now you can't tell what time of night this is. This could be 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. But this gentleman is in his crazy creek. He's outside, there's no bugs. And he's catching up on some reading. Other guys are hiking, other guys are doing whatever. 
these two guys travel together a lot. They were the guys that were <clears throat> paddling together in that previous slide. And um, they brought some cigars and um, they kindly smoked them away from the rest of us. And notice the tents are, are spread out where people would like to be. And um, they're enjoying the evening. And we don't always carry a big bug, bug shelter, but on some trips when we have the room, we'll take them because they're really nice. They get you out of the bugs and you can relax. And this guy after dinner is, is reading. And we've had guys bring kites with them. It's great for play. And you can bring a big kite and put it on a wire and you can put a GoPro on it. And this is the Alaskan no attack trip. The big river's on the left. There's a tributary coming in. So one of the fun things on some of these rivers when they braid out is the lead canoe has to figure out which of those little tributaries you're going to go down. And on the Kazan River, which braids out, the secret is you always stay to your left, because if you don't, you've got a two and a half mile um, paddle across the braided parts coming in and it's all sand. And if you get windbound, you don't want to camp there. Midnight sun, this is sunrise sunset. It's kind of simultaneously a dip below the horizon. It comes right back up. So equipment, you need checklists. And then you need some key duplicate items. Not everything can be duplicated, but you need some key duplicate items. You need to have quality gear. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it has to be quality. You wouldn't go buy a tent at Walmart and take it to the tundra. It's not going to work. What you do have must be in good condition. It can be older, but it must be in good condition. You coordinate for the type of trip you're going to do. And when I say coordinate, that means if, if you're going to be uh, <clears throat> far enough north where it's going to be quite chilly, you, know, you got to have clothing that can go from maybe the, the 20s all the way up to the 70s. Okay. You must be willing to make changes or substitute. You go to the boundary waters with your favorite gear. And I can tell you from experience, some of it will not work in the Arctic, okay? If it's really worn out, you replace it. And I check my gear and periodically the things I wear the most, which are socks and footwear and pants, those are the things I'm replacing most frequently. And the biggest question is the old and tried versus new. So I know when Gore-Tex came out, I was very careful about that because I'd heard some bad rumors that if you were in a dusty environment, it couldn't couldn't uh, wick out the uh, or would wick in water, and you couldn't wick out your sweat. Today, it's not an issue, I don't think. And you can also get ideas on what you should do from people like myself who've been there. So we have to travel sometimes, and we have to use different kinds of transportation. And your gear has to be packed in such a way is that it won't get broken or damaged. You notice there's a gas can there <clears throat> and we um, could not fly the gas can to where we're going. We flew it empty because we, there's no guarantee there would be a container when we got there. And then we bought fuel in bulk and that was for our stoves. <clears throat> here we're getting ready to go on a trip and I have one case as cameras, one case as my CPAP, my, my, day, my day pack, my hiking boots which I can wear in the plane because we're gonna land on the tundra. And then when I need to go on the water, I'll take out my, my rubber boots. And a red homemade map case is uh, containing all our maps. The Les Voyager kids have a treat. The, uh, the prisoners in the St. Cloud Penitentiary do this artwork on their paddles for them. And each one is personalized, which is kind of nice. Quality tents have to do two things, bug and water have to be bug proof, have to be waterproof, <clears throat> very critical. We've been using the, the lean twos and lean threes They replaced the tarps, but the adaptation I made Dan do for me is he sewed these red flaps on because sometimes the ground will not take a stake very well and you have to use rocks. And if they're on a windy day, if the rocks are being abraded against the fabric, you'll probably get a hole in it. And notice that we have, again, a weight in our canoe, so it can't blow away. So that was bad wind at Baker Lake, and I would have turned my tent around, except I was 
solo, the rest of the crew had left and I would never get it back up. But that day the waves were six feet on the other side of the, of the lake. Some people were stuck on that side who had to get a plane and they ended up hiring a helicopter, which is not always at Baker Lake to come and pick them up. And they left their canoes there and somebody had to go get them later. Here's our CCS <clears throat> uh, lean three shelter from the back. Now, if this were in the woods, we could tie that back up and, and, and pull it up, but we can't, so we stick a pole underneath. And here we are in front, and the guys uh, brought in some beer the first day to celebrate the start of our trip. It's a good way to maybe get some <laughs> camaraderie going. <clears throat> Here's our portable kitchen. They were invented and made in Minnesota. They're no longer being made. I wish they were. I've gone through three of them over my lifetime. They get banged up when you fly a lot and it contains everything. It's got everything we need to set up. It's got all the bowls, plates, silverware, uh, spices, uh, water bottles, stoves, everything is right there. We use 111, we use MSR stoves now. I used to use 111Bs until they changed the construction of them and they had um, lots of O-rings, which I didn't care for. So I went back, I went to a dragonfly, <clears throat> but the dragonfly can simmer. And a lot of the MSR stoves are made to heat water fast and they're made for backpackers and freeze dried meals and are not made for simmering. And um, so I use those and I, you can carry an extra burner head on the stove and I carry at least one with me because it's an emergency. If the stove clogs, it's repairable, but I will uh, just slap the new burner head in and repair it later. Toilet paper, if you want to use it, and the reason I say that is some people don't use it or don't need it. If you want to use it, you have to burn it because it'll be around forever and it doesn't break down very often. Uh, the Y camps don't use toilet paper. They collect rocks that are the size of a half dollar and they use those. I guess it's effective. So here's a no cook lunch. We have a lot of no cook lunches so we don't have to waste a lot of time. And notice that we have bowls of different color and you use the same bowl every day. And we have uh, insulated mugs, which I think is essential if you want hot fluids to stay hot. And some of those insulated mugs have zip ties on them and that identifies who you are. It all fits into that blue container which slides up in one of the shelves. And uh, you can see our cook kit has all nesting pots and a couple of fry pans. And we rotate each day someone has a job and um, the way we would do it is you would do breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the whole day. And in the next two days, you have no responsibility. And that way people are not fighting over having my turn or I don't want it to do today. You just do it. So you do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you coordinate, and you got a partner you work with all the time, and then you're off for two days. And so when the guys are, are making lunch, you can take a quick hike, you could cast a, for a fish, you can do whatever you want to do. <clears throat> So here's Baffin Island, Soper River, and all the barrels are what we had to use. And um, the barrels fit into this thing called a sore inflatable. It's like a giant inner tube, and it's only the width of the barrels. The, the, the seats are terrible to sit in, but it's made for rocky streams, especially in the mountains, and it works very well. And on a lake, it gets blown around, obviously. And on a headwind, it's terrible. You can't go anywhere. We get we eat a lot of fish. We don't eat fish every day, but we do count on fish and the smaller the better for cleaning and, and frying. And this is a grayling caught on a MEP spinner, big dorsal fin. So it's, it's caught in fast water and you think you got a whale on because uh, when that dorsal fin is pushing against the current, it creates a lot of drag. Fried fish is delicious. We carry some oil with us. Um, <clears throat> We change it from the bottle that comes in from the store. That plastic isn't real strong. Put it in something heavier and like maybe an algae bottle. And then we take various kinds of breading to help it. Um, you can use cornmeal. You can use prepared seasoned breading. I carry solar chargers. These are my original ones. They're daisy chained together because I now have a CPAP. I retired and when I was 60. I didn't know I had sleep apnea. I totally ran out of gas, so I quit working six months later. My physical I told my doctor I had no energy. He sent me to a sleep lab. 
an hour later after testing me, they said I had stopped breathing 72 times an hour. And I've been doing that for years. And the doctor the next day said I had no REM sleep. So I have newer solar panels. And I, the nice thing about the Arctic is we have a ton of sun. And I leave these out while we're paddling all day. And my battery gets recharged. This is required when you go to Canada, no matter if you go to Quetico or you go all the way to the Arctic. You must have a whistle. And Dan Cook on his map case has little whistles that you can actually blow in. I don't know if everybody can hear them, but they're technically legal. And you need a throw bag or throw rope and you need something to pump water out or a bucket to throw it over the side. So those are three things, whistle, throw rope and something to throw water out. So here's my Skeena, completely outfitted and ready to go. And our packs are standing upright because we have too many packs to lay down, put the heavier stuff in the bottom. And then it's a dog sled cover and you drop everything in and you put the cover over and then you strap it down. You slide fishing rods in there and extra paddles in there. <clears throat> here's a 17 foot pack boat. It rolls up in a bag. The Ribs are preformed. The rest of the pieces are shock corded. I do not want to stand on that tubing. So below that map case, you can see that there's a, uh, a black item with the white edges. And those are two pieces of foam with a quarter inch plastic spline that had been chemically glued together with a piece of pack cloth on top. And that way you can stand or kneel and not be affecting the tubing. We also, to make them stronger and more reinforced, is we zip tie um, anytime two pieces of metal cross each other. So here we are trapped in this jail at the bottom of the Owl River. And this is where the biologists do their research in the, in the winter. But there's no bears there. But the park management says we have to sleep there. And with two rangers, we didn't have a choice. But that's how fast the pack boats take apart. They go in the bag. And away we go. It's amazing. And I've had these now for 15 years. I can fly them right from the Minneapolis airport right to uh, Alaska to Kotzebue and put them in a small bush plane and away we go. <clears throat> so now you got to get there, you got to get in and you got to get home. And the reason I say that is sometimes you start a river and you end 400 miles away and you come out a different way. You don't come back to where you started. So border crossings to Canada are simple, but there are some basic rules. And if you don't have the right, the right equipment or you don't have the right identification, and if you've had an offense in the States that is not a major offense here, but it is in Canada, you won't get in. And that is a DWI or a drinking violation. <clears throat> I've seen people turned away because as a college kid, a guy got a DWI and 10 years later, he's going up to fish and it's on his record and they won't let him in the country. And then you need to have a bush plane, maybe for most trips. And then you have to be aware of what search and rescue options are available, if any. You are best to register with authorities. You'd always leave a trip plan before you leave home. And you wanna be 100% self-sufficient. And if you can't be self-sufficient, you have no reason to go. And you bring a credit card with a high value. That means if your credit card has got 10 grand on it, but you own eight, that doesn't give you much to work with. And I take three credit cards. I only use one made basically at home, but I keep the other two so that I can have them in three different places. And that's my backup for being self-sufficient. Here's Canada welcoming. No matter when you go to Canada and how many lanes they have open, or should it have open, they only have one open, mostly it's a manpower thing. <clears throat> I always get my passport. I have a passport card. The passport card goes on the water with me and the passport would stay in the car unless we are not coming back to the car. Then I have to take it with me. You can buy alcohol at a duty free. You have to buy it before you go in the country and not all borders have a duty free option. But when they do, it's virtually half price because alcohol in Minnesota is priced at 50%. So a $35 bottle of rum would cost 17 at the border, but you're only allowed to bring one, but you can bring one per person. If you want to bring bear spray, you have to identify it. 
you can't fly bear spray commercially. So if you're flying commercial to go someplace, you have to buy it when you get there. The good and the bad of bear spray is it does work if the bear's close, it's only can use once. So it's a one shot deal. And um, the bear spray cannot be mace, it has to be pepper spray. And there's a lot of animal spray sold down in the States that is mace based. That's what a lot of postal people carry. And I throw the lemonade in there for two reasons. One, we mix lemonade and, and 151 rum and we make a cocktail at night with a fresh lime. And that's kind of a Navy tradition that we picked up in our reading. And the other is that screw top is waterproof. And when it's done, you've got another waterproof jug to carry things or put things in. And when the bugs are really bad, that waterproof jugs goes in your tent and that becomes your pee bottle. <clears throat> so here at Manitoba, we always check in and we always get the latest maps. Love their money in Canada. And uh, one year we had a bush pilot it would only take cash. I had to bring up $4,000 in cash. That was a hassle. I carry my, my old driver's license on the water if I'm coming back to my car. And I leave my current driver's license. I bury it in a safe place in my car. And when we, they expire, they cut the edge off. But the information's the same. I'm the same person, have the same birthday. Everything's the same. So it's another good ID backup. I was driven Volkswagens because that's what I could afford. I had the original buses, which were box on wheels, and you sat right over the bumper and you looked down at all the dead roadkill that you're going over, or someone had gone over. <clears throat> and we can carry a lot of gear. And here I have pack boats in the back. It's easier to carry than ever. We are going to fly in directly with the bush pilot. So I'm bringing my own fuel because I'm not flying it up commercially. And um, the red thing is my toolbox that when I break down, hopefully I can fix something. We've also used trains as an option to get us where we're going. And we've used them for the Deer River. We got dropped off and then paddled to Churchill. We here, we got dropped off and paddled the Owl River. Took an act of God to get a permit to do the Owl River. Notice the train tracks are not <laughs> the best laid and the train goes really slow, really slow, sometimes 15 miles an hour. And we stop and look at things on the way. So here we're going up and this is the Grand Rapids. This is where the Saskatchewan River comes into Lake Winnipeg. Big earthen dam, quite interesting. Here's a big waterfall on Hay River on the way to to Great Slave Lake, it's right off the road. Always had to take a ferry and that's now been replaced by a bridge, but the ferry was free and it took everything that went across to go further north. <clears throat> we were stuck in Baker Lake. The plane to fly us in was uh, way behind schedule, making up for weather. Um, this guy up there doing some mining work had his helicopter and after hours, he flew us 40 miles over to Princess Mary Lake. The Beaver, which is the workhorse for the North, goes way back to World War II time. They're wonderful airplanes, a lot of them in Alaska. Here's a single otter on floats on wheels. It can take off from an airstrip, land it in the water, fly back to the airstrip. Here's our single otter on wheels. This is what I needed to do the Aerosmith. It took us 10 years to get a plane in that area that worked. See our brand new pack boats. <clears throat> the Twin Otter, absolute best plane available. We could put six people, three canoes, all our gear. Some companies, because of insurance regulations now, are not flying three canoes. So here's a twin otter on Baffin Island. We flew in, uh, got dropped off to the Soper River. And the next picture is going to show you this taking off. And this thing takes off in less than the length of a football field. It's called short takeoff and landing. So you saw how fast that wheel came up and they were gone. <clears throat> so very essential. Some people carry pepper spray and I do. Um, and then we can carry sound uh, whistles and as you can get these whiz bang things you can buy in Canada. I think they're illegal in the United States in most places and you can a uh, little pen thing that goes in your pocket, stick one of those on you press the button it goes bing, bing, bing and maybe scares the bear, doesn't track them. <clears throat> we used to carry it starting in the 90s. We could get a, a transponder that you could say, I need help. And it's like 911 type thing, you know. Um, and that got replaced with an inReach, which you can now text 
and or send an SOS. Inreaches are waterproof, but they don't float. And that little orange thing on the upper right is the life jacket for the inreach. So you put that on and then clip it on. The phone is not to call anybody. There's no reception. I, the inReach is a hassle to type a message. You do one letter at a time by scrolling. And if you Bluetooth it with the phone, you can use the phone keypad. And then the other, the thing on the bottom is a little storage battery. It's good for probably three or four uh, recharges before you have to use a solar charger to fix it. Satellite phones are good. Sometimes uh, the question is, are they uh, giving people a false sense of security and going where they shouldn't be? <clears throat> so some lasting memories, I'm running out of time here. <clears throat> so the ice that we've seen on the ocean Hudson Bay is fantastic. The land of the midnight sun is really something to experience. The Anukshuks show the Inuit history and you will find evidence of these all across the tundra. You'll find nesting bird eggs if you're at the right time of year. You'll see young hedged out falcons. You can see ptarmigan that are changing their colors in August. You can see six six that are gonna hibernate for nine months. These are ground squirrels. You may run into a polar bear. They're only found on Hudson Bay and the Arctic coast. And uh, they're now becoming in trouble with climate change. They primarily live off the ice and they kill seals. This was fantastic. First trip on a no attack, we are in camp, bear shows up, we've got three cubs, some mother, we're wondering what the hell's gonna happen, we don't have a gun, and she caught five salmon, ignored us completely. However, we all slept inside the electric fence that night. You can see caribou in some rivers, not all the time, you can see muskox in some places. <clears throat> You can see beluga whales on Hudson Bay and in the Arctic Ocean, and they're curious and they'll swim under your boat. And there's lots of bright colors. Fireweed, which is all over, grows very small, is dwarfed in the Arctic. Cotton grass is also dwarfed in the Arctic. And fall colors come early. They come in September. In Minnesota, they don't come till October. The Horton River has three canyons and they were just a hoot to paddle. And in one of the canyons is one of the best campsites I've ever, ever had. And the pool of water there is about 30 feet deep and had giant fish in it. But you could have camped there for a whole week, some fantastic hiking, and just a chance to be on your own time. Wilberforce Falls is magic, absolutely magic. And this is a sunset on the hood. So the old saying goes, Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. So good planning makes for a great trip. You need to do your homework and you'll be prepared. And we always show respect why we fly and carry the flag of the, the province or territory we are in. And I took this off the shirt that my Nordic ski team made. All these kids make sayings on their, on their high school shirts. So I thought it was very appropriate. You need to have a dream. If you don't dream going up somewhere in a canoe trip, it's never going to happen. And then you have to live that dream. But for that dream to really be lived, you have to set the goals to make it work, and then you'll achieve it. So have a dream, live it, set a goal, achieve it. And if you don't take that first step, your trip can never begin. So best wishes for a safe and memorial <clears throat> journey. And thanks for watching. I'm available at Bob's Canoe at Comcast.net and make sure you get the net part, not the com part. And if you got questions or want to share, or if you want my expedition planner, send me an email, be glad to hear from you. Thank you, Bob, that was great. <clears throat> Love seeing uh, all the old, uh, <clears throat> just a variety of vegetation and animals and you know, a lot of really cool shots there. Um, um, <clears throat> I don't see any questions in the chat here. I was wondering about though, um, sort of how, you know, some, you know, some of these, you know, you're going down rivers in, in canoes. Um, what sort of length have you found like in, in those tandem canoes? I know they can range anywhere from like 15 to 17 feet. What are you? Well, nothing less than 17. You got to have yeah. a 
you can't you don't have the capacity for everything. Yeah. I loved, I had 18 foot Grumman's and they had 72 inches of cargo space. I wow. paddled 20 foot Grumman's on the ocean. They have a lot of space. Um, the Skeena is just shy of 17, but there's no, there's no air chambers. So it actually has as much room as a 17. <laughs> But um, uh, smaller than that, you, you couldn't take a long trip. If you wanted a 15 or so, you could go out for a week maybe, but mm -hmm. and they don't paddle as well. So you yeah. need a longer canoe. Yeah, yeah. Right on. Um, a lot of really good uh, sort of uh, tips in there. Uh, I love I love the, uh, the ideas of just like zip tying the extra, the, where the two pieces of metal cross just to give it a bit yeah. more structure and support. Yeah. A lot of really good tips and tricks there on, <clears throat> on how to keep your gear working better. And, and uh, you know, over time, you, you, you kind of <clears throat> almost, uh, you know, you, you know a stove so well, you figure out its, its, its shortcomings and you find ways to, you know, make it work, you know. And, and, uh, and I like your idea of bringing up, bringing that extra burner head and just, I'll repair it later. I just got to put the new one on and continue to go, you know, little things like that. Yeah. Exactly right. So the thing is, the first trip is a learning and the second trip is better and the third trip is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. Well, I put your email address in the chat box here. So if anyone wants to reach out to you, they can do that. Um, just want to remind our viewers that we are recording all these presentations and they'll be on our YouTube page. So head over to YouTube uh, and search Midwest Mountaineering um, and you'll be able to find this and all the other presentations Bob has done and some of our other presenters as well. Um, with that being said, I think we'll go ahead and sign off. And um, thank you so much for your time and your knowledge and your willingness to share it. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of this uh, beginning of May. Thanks, Bob. Thank you so much. And we'll, we'll talk soon. <clears throat> Bye. Take care.